Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, happy Monday. Um, as you all know, the election is uh, a week from tomorrow, or more to the point, the election ends a week from tomorrow. Um, you can vote now. Um, most people in the country at this point can vote now. So I think it's important to actually really shift the framing on this, and it seems to be working, uh, that the election is not on uh, Tuesday, November 3rd. It merely ends on Tuesday, November 3rd. Uh, the election is ongoing right now. Um, and I just would point out, we're, we're going to save a lot of this kind of material for um, subsequent, uh, you know, for election week, such as it is. Uh, but I would just call your attention to this uh, website here, which I will put in the chat. This is the election project here, copy and uh, paste. And what you can see here is track uh, early voting and how many people have voted. So I have a, a particular challenge to those of you who are Californians um, that we, we California has submitted 65, uh, 6.5 6 million ballots already, uh, but Texas is ahead of us and that is unacceptable. Uh, Texas has passed 7.5 million votes in Texas. Um, I, I will not be uh, outdone by Texas. Um, California must beat Texas in early voting numbers. <laughs> um, I, I, but I, let's just put it this way. Like the numbers coming out of Texas are just blockbuster right now in terms of early voting returns. They're massive. This is, this is huge news coming out of Texas. Um, uh, in, we don't know how this is going to skew, but we do know that large voter turnout skews um, Democratic, it skews to the Democrats. Low voter turnout skews to the Republicans. High voter turnout skews Republicans. Whether that remains the case this year, we will see soon enough, or really not even close to soon enough, but we will find out eventually. Um, and then there's Florida, with more than 6 million votes already cast in Florida, uh, and uh, Georgia with 2.7 million votes already. And what's particularly powerful about Georgia right now is that more uh, apparently, like, during a, a couple of counts, I've seen press reports so far, that more Black folks have voted in Georgia already than voted in the whole of 2016. That is in itself massive news. Um, and so this is something worth uh, continuing to track. Um, and to pay close attention to. Now, um, today we're gonna do a number of different things. Um, I'm gonna uh, be open uh, a little bit with a, a bit about Proposition 16. Uh, then we'll turn it to Saru, who's got the main topic for the lecture today. But my understanding is there is an announcement that someone is gonna make. Saru, do you wanna help out with that? Yeah, Caitlin, would you like to do the announcement about the resolution? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm in ASUC Senator Shaka Talem's office, and we have recently Drafted a, drafted a resolution which would basically make a non-instructional holiday on election day at UC Berkeley. So this would advance student civic engagement and institutionalize voter turnout, especially for marginalized communities that have been alienated, alienated from the democratic process. And so we're fighting for UC Berkeley to include civic learning courses as part of their education, general education requirements, um, hold voter registration drives, excuse absences for all poll workers and hold workshops promoting civic engagement. But bottom line, we just wanna make election day permanently a non-instructional holiday at Berkeley. And we want to eventually extend this to all UC schools. So um, right now we're just looking for co-sponsors. So if you're part of like any clubs or organizations or just a leader on campus, we'd love for you to co-sponsor our um, resolution. So in the chat, I'm gonna be including a link to our resolution if anyone is interested in reading it. Um, and then I'm also going to be putting um, a separate link to the co-sponsorship form. So if you guys could just like um, reach out to friends to co-sponsor this, um, that would be great because we just really want to make a non-instructional holiday on election day. Um, we're not sure if, this, if it could happen this year, but we eventually want it to happen. So yeah, thank you so much. Caitlin, thank you for your initiative. Um, hopefully people will sign up and participate in this. I think that this is essential. I, I agree. And not just that. I mean, like, let's be frank, like not only election day should be a national holiday, not just a day off from teaching at the University of California, Berkeley. It should be a national holiday. Like, I mean, if it doesn't show you the 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 the, the fundamentally anti-democratic nature of our constitution and the founding fathers, could they have picked? a more inconvenient day for there to be election day, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in the, the month of November. 
who who has a Tuesday off in November to spend all day in line voting? The bourgeoisie and the slave owning classes, they do. <laughs> They have plenty of time to vote on a Tuesday, but the rest of us, particularly working people, do not. So, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it doesn't take a big, you know, galaxy sized brain to uh, throw over uh, a Columbus Day and uh, declare Election Day a national holiday. That should be a gimme. Um, but thank you for your efforts. I, I, I very much appreciate that. Um, I am going to just do um, a short piece here uh, in uh, to a uh, lead in to Saro's uh, primary lecture uh, on the question uh, in particular of Prop 16, um, something that uh, is directly relevant. I mean, it really came out of, in fact, came out of the University of California at Berkeley. Um, now, what we, of course, what we know is that Prop 16 uh, is on the California ballot, and it is a, a constitutional amendment that would overturn Prop 209 which banned affirmative action um, both in, uh, in uh, public um, consideration for contracting and admission in higher education. And this was passed by California voters in 1996. So Prop 16 is an attempt to simply overturn an old proposition, which is a lot of what happens with ballot measures is they get passed and then they get unpassed or they get passed and they get declared unconstitutional or they get passed, they get unpassed. Uh, this happened on the, the level of the United States Constitution with um, prohibition, which was passed um, with an, you know, the 18th Amendment and then repealed with the 22nd Amendment. Um, but in California in particular, uh, this is an article from Berkeley side, um, that indicates that it was indeed the advocacy of UC Berkeley students who um, managed to get uh, Prop 16 on the ballot for um, this uh, upcoming election cycle. And part of the question is to ask, you know, well, why, you know, is this an important thing to address right now? Um, what are the possibilities of the passage of this um, in 2020, particularly after uh, the summer that we have experienced here in California and around the country, and what the survival or the possibility of reviving affirmative action in the state of California could actually mean. Now, I think it's worth um, a little bit of a walk uh, to think about the ballot measure process in California, where Prop 209 came from and how we come to the verge of repealing it and whether or not indeed it will be repealed. Now, California famously has the reputation nationally of being the left coast, that we are, as Gavin Newsom likes to say, America's coming attraction, um, you know, or as goes California, so goes the nation. All of these leading indicators are that California sets the tone of the direction of national politics. And because of their kind of leadership role that California has really had since the early 20th century, um, it has led to you know, outsized kind of exaggerated understandings of California's importance in a whole host of different directions. Not the least of which is the belief that California is this intractably uh, progressive state. Now, this of course is on the one, and I will dispute whether that's true or not, because it's not. We're not a progressive state, we're merely a democratic state. We are run by Democrats, not by progressives, and which is why it was impossible to actually remove someone like two years ago to remove someone like Dianne Feinstein, the richest, the oldest, the most conservative member of the Democratic caucus who absolutely abjectly failed to present any meaningful opposition to the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett. In fact, hugged uh, the Republican head of the committee to thank him for such effective and gracious hearings. And, and this is not an accident that Dianne Feinstein is the oldest richest, most conservative member of the Democratic caucus and the oldest and richest member of the United States Senate. She is the embodiment of the plutocratic gerontocracy that governs both California and the United States in general. Now, I'll talk about that a little bit more next week, but it's important to remember that California has this kind of outsized role. So if, but Similarly, if we're so liberal, if we're so progressive, why is it that the three presidents that have come from California, only one of them was born here. Does anyone know who the three presidents from California are or were? Only two of them were actually born in California. One of them was only born in California. The other two merely ran from California. Okay, yes, Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon was actually born in California. And the third, really the first, think Stanford, think Stanford, no, 
Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover and the Hoover Institute, the right wing think tank uh, over at Stanford, which is a perennial embarrassment to academia and the state of California. Um, now, the issue uh, is that, right, so California has this, we produce right-wing politicians, yet somehow we're this very progressive state. Kamala Harris is close as any California, progressive Californian or liberal California has ever gotten to the White House already. So like that's something worth marking. California land of celebrity and all of this, but yet the celebrities that get elected to office are not progressives. They're all Republicans. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a governor. Sonny Bono was, was a Republican governor. Sonny Bono was a right-wing uh, House member from Southern California. So so on and so on and so on. But California's long history also has a kind of progressive impact on the rest of the nation. So in 1911, California voters passed a ballot measure, a special election in October of 1911 that introduced the ballot initiative, referendum, and recall process into the progressive era. And this was an important contribution to the progressive era attempts to bring democracy under popular control. So the citizens of the state could put laws on the ballot to be voted on. They could issue uh, recalls of uh, politicians that they did not like. Now, this spread across the country, and now most states have a process of uh, initiative, referendum, and recall. It was a kind of permanent um, uh, reform that landed across the, you know, started in California and spread to the other states. But of course, the ballot initiative process is enormously difficult and had a very slow start. The process of getting a ballot on a, 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 an idea onto the ballot um, is a, a, a war of attrition by and large. The nine out of 10 proposals uh, that, that make it to even the first stages of getting it onto the ballot never actually find their way onto the ballot. And two thirds of all of the ballot measures that have historically been voted on by Californians have been voted down. So there's a, the very few actually make it onto the ballot. Most of them fail. And yet our ballot is like, what, 12 pages long? Now, part of the process of what's important about this is the understanding of the ways in which, and there's lots of things that we vote on, right? California regularly rejects bans on abortion. We regularly uh, support, we supported medical marijuana. Uh, we supported marijuana legalization. Like the, there's all sorts of things that are getting voted on. But one of the most important and persistent are issues around race and the ways in which California has comprehensively, systematically undone all national efforts to redress racism and advance civil rights through the ballot and referendum process. California's ballot measures have undone civil rights laws and civil rights movements with tremendous effectiveness through the whole of the post-war period. The ballot measure process in California is a vehicle of white supremacy overwhelmingly, at least historically speaking. And I draw here from a truly remarkable book uh, by uh, Daniel Martinez Hosang called Racial Propositions, Ballot Measures in the Making of Post-War California. And he writes, quote, California's system of direct democracy has proven to be a reliable bulwark against many leading civil rights and anti-discrimination issues. Attending to the political labor that race performs helps resolve a central contradiction of California. How a state that so publicly reveres and symbolizes ideas of human development, possibility and achievement treats the incapacitation and immiseration of so many of its inhabitants as both natural and inevitable. And indeed, California ballot measures have undone most of the, much of the work of creating a more just society, starting indeed with the, the proposition that launched Ronald Reagan's career and run for the governor in California, which was Prop 14, which exempted real estate transactions from anti-discrimination laws and attempted to nullify a Fair Housing Act that ended redlining in California. So the state legislature bans redlining in California and the voters voted to restore it. Now this was later, this was passed in 1964, and this was later declared unconstitutional. Prop 21 passed in 1972, which prohibited mandatory desegregation in schools, and Prop 1 passed in 1979, halted all state desegregation orders of the schools. So voters voted, the citizens of California voted to preserve school segregation on more than one occasion. Two propositions in 1984 and 1986, California moved to prohibit multilingual ballots and declare English the official state language in 1986. And in 1998, Proposition 227 
uh, ended most bilingual programs of education across the state. In 1994, Prop 184 increased sentences for criminal offenses, what is known as the three strikes law, right? That, that led to a massive explosion in the California prison system. In 1994, also Prop 187 passed, which would prevent undocumented immigrants from receiving social, uh, public social health and educational services. This would have banned undocumented students from the universe from public education. This would have banned undocumented people from hospitals and receiving welfare. This passed in California in 1994, one of the most draconian anti-immigrant laws ever passed in the United States, yet it was declared unconstitutional a few years later. Proposition, um, uh, as you will recall, proposition, well, you might recall, on the very day that Barack Obama was elect, put over the top in 2008 uh, by the state of California, California voters uh, voted to ban gay marriage with Prop 8. So like, remember that in 2008, Californians banned gay marriage. That was also uh, overthrown um, by the Supreme Court. Uh, and then of course is Prop 209, which banned affirmative action in California. California was the first state to ban affirmative action. It would later be followed by 10 subsequent states that have, sub that have followed the basic model and banned affirmative action. Prop 209, uh, was backed by a conservative black businessman and UC regent uh, by the name of Ward Connerly, who you'll see here. Uh, Prop 209 sought to ban affirmative action and race-based consideration of preferences in hiring for state contractors and admission to public schools and universities. Ward Connerly argued that affirmative action was detrimental to black students because it suggested that they cannot earn their position. Quote, do you know what reinforces the idea that they, meaning black students, are inferior, being told they need a preference to succeed? This is Ward Connerly's statement. Now, this is, to be blunt, self-fulfilling logic, one that relies upon the racist discrimination to make its point that the means of mitigating and resolving racial discrimination should be abolished. It is based on a flatly false assertion, namely that black and brown students need affirmative preferences to succeed. They need affirmative preferences to gain admission to universities, to gain admission to um, 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 you know, uh, the contracting uh, possibilities within the state. They don't need these in order to succeed. Right, Success is an individual measure, but admission is a social question. So this discrimination that grows out, by and large, what we know is that the discrimination against black and brown students grows out of the inequality of the public school system, not out of the inferiority of black and brown students or their inability or lack of drive to succeed. Those are racist stereotypes that this ballot measure depended upon to galvanize white resentment and to build the idea that affirmative action was somehow discriminatory against white people. Nevertheless, Proposition 209 passed with 54% of the vote in which 63% of white people, then 75% of the state population voted for it. Blacks and Latinos in the state voted 75% against it. And Asian Americans, most significantly at the time, only 5% of the state population voted against it 63% to 34 in favor. Following California's lead, affirmative action was subsequently banned in Washington, Florida, um, uh, uh, is that, sorry, like Michigan, sorry, excuse me, Michigan, Nebraska, Arizona, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, and Idaho. Uh, so again, what starts in California spreads to the rest of the country. Now, the impact of Prop 209 on underrepresented minorities at the University of California, particularly the flagship universities of Berkeley and UCLA, was enormous and immediate. You can see here in these numbers that African-American enrollment dropped from about 9%, which is roughly their percentage of the population, to less than 2%. Uh, the 2019 incoming freshman class at UC Berkeley was just 2.8% African-American, 2.8%. Um, Amongst Latinos it is probably the even bigger uh, drop in which that only uh, as of 2011, these numbers are pretty old. Um, and and that, that number has gone up. Uh, the, the Latino enrollment went up significantly in the fall of 2020, but it is still well below their percentage in the population. White enrollment has in fact come down, whereas Asian American enrollment has gone up significantly in this period in which a population now that is about 15% of the state population represents nearly 40% of the population 
education at UC Berkeley, 30 plus percent or 38, 39% across the UC system. So under this system, Colorblind policies like Prop, o, Prop 209 created a massively discriminatory system that when you take a project that is designed to alleviate the structural racism of the society, namely affirmative action, and you eliminate it, the society regresses to the mean. It returns back to the status of mass discrimination. Now, the people, it turns out, have been able to take the greatest advantage of this uh, are not white folks, but Asian Americans, which is why it's significant that the groups that are leading the, the, the drive against Prop 16 are Asian American groups who believe that ending affirmative action would be discriminatory towards them. Now, the issue really is that there is a kind of zero sum game that goes on here that when we're talking about admissions to the University of California. Now, if the affirmative action is gonna pass and they're going to create more space for black and brown applicants, those, those they're gonna take the seats of other people. Now, the assumption here is that those seats belong to some people, and if you displace them, you'll be displacing them with inferior candidates. And so this is a kind of embracing of a, a racist logic that has shifted originally from white folks in 1996, now largely in being embraced by Asian American groups in uh, 2020. Um, a study, a recent study, however, I think that is enormously important, and this is the last thing I wanna cover here, um, and I highly suggest you all look at this, a study conducted by Zachary uh, Bleemer, uh, who is a, an economist here at the University of California at Berkeley, used a data from two, uh, 1994 to 2002 to track high school admissions across the United States, track course selection and eventual employment records of students who work their way through the University of California system. Now, after Prop 209, Black and Latinx enrollment at UC Berkeley and UCLA collapsed, as we know. And those students were denied uh, entry uh, to the, the flagship universities. Indeed, African-American applications um, uh, declined 31% in a single year. Admissions rate declined 31% in a single year for Black students between 1997 and 1998. Just a complete collapse, right? Those students, however, were not able to go to Berkeley or UCLA, often tried to, you know, are pushed down the system and found entry into less selective universities than displacing students there further down the hierarchy. And what this study found was that as they get pushed down, as black and brown students get pushed down, they eventually reach the bottom in which black and brown students are pushed out of the system entirely. And so what you find across this process is that African-American students and Latinx students have seen their incomes decline 5% per year per graduating student under Prop 209. We've seen a steep decline, not only in the opportunities provided to black and brown students, but their income possibilities, their earning potential and the like. And what, um, uh, what you find here, right, is that this came at a terrible time. Prop 209 coming in 1996, being put into effect 1997, came at a terrible time, particularly because it means that black and brown students who would have been in STEM programs and computer science and elsewhere, who were removed from the University of California, Berkeley and UCLA, missed gaining entry into the tech boom of the early 2000s. And so every conversation you hear about how Google and Facebook and Twitter can't hire black and brown engineers. They can't keep and retain black and brown engineers. Um, part of that is because of the racist culture of those companies, but part of it is because Prop 209 eliminated um, uh, black and brown students from the universities that these um, big companies recruit from. And this has had a huge knock-on effect in terms of the deleterious impacts on earning and income potential of black and brown uh, Californians since since 1997. Um, what you also find though, and this is the, the probably one of the more surprising aspects of this um, study is that Asian and white kids who took the places of black and brown students after Prop 209 saw no meaningful rise in their income because of this policy. Black, Asian and white students gained nothing 
They maintained their same level of income, of uh, educational attainment. There was no positive change detectable for Asian and white students measurable across the society. So there's a huge deleterious effect on black and brown students and no meaningful advantage to white and Asian students, which means that banning affirmative action simply hurts the state of California, hurts its citizens and gains nothing in advantage. And the reason why white and Asian students are not uh, gain no advantage with Pro after Prop 209 is because if they can't get into Berkeley, there's plenty of other schools for them to go to. There's plenty of private universities. There's plenty of other public universities for them to go to. So it's not like there's, a, you know, while we think of admissions as a zero sum game, this is not, it is not a zero sum game. Like this is actually a landscape, not of scarcity, but of abundance. There are ample numbers of universities for people to attend, right? particularly wealthy or upper middle class families, which indeed the Asian Americans that we're talking about here, and of course that population splits. We're talking Chinese American, Korean American, Taiwanese American, Japanese American, who are in that upper income bracket, as opposed to Filipinos, Vietnamese Americans, and other groups who are in the lower end of those brackets. So there's a big kind of split there. So Asian Americans and whites don't gain much of anything from Prop 209 frankly, because they're already wealthy enough and they already attend high quality enough schools that they can get into other universities and elsewhere. So there's plenty of other colleges and universities. And the real issue here, though, is in a certain sense, on a public scale, there really isn't. And this is the real cry. I should say, read this quote here. This is from the New York Times, right? This is their conclusion. In other words, the measure in California seems to have set back a generation of Black and Hispanic students, pushing them down and out of the University of California system and helping to widen the racial wealth gap with seemingly little offsetting benefits for other students. That's the baseline of what Prop 209 has done, according to this study. Now, I think the important thing I would say, and the way I will end is that the real issue here is state disinvestment in public higher education. That's the fundamental issue is state disinvestment in public higher education. It's important to remember that the state of California has only built one new UC since 1968. So they built the University of California, Santa Cruz in 1968. And between 1968 and 2020, they have built one new UC. That is, of course, Merced, the only one outside. There's Davis, of course. But so there are only two UCs in the, uh, in the Central Valley. And they have built one new, C, new UC in a time in which the population of the state of California has doubled. In 1968, when Santa Cruz opened, the population of the state of California was 19.3 million. Today, it is nearly 40 million, and public higher education resources have not grown accordingly. They haven't grown anywhere nearly as much as they need to in order to actually provide for the citizens of the state of California. And this, principally, is why affirmative action and the fight over admissions to university, the UC system, is so tenacious and so troubling. But it's also worth reflecting and remembering that while California has this liberal progressive veneer, this liberal progressive narrative that particularly the right wing likes to put upon us to show the limits of the possibilities of politics, we are nowhere near as progressive a state as most people think. Right now, Prop 16 is way behind in the very limited polling that has been done. Um, the, the advocates of Prop 16 have spent more than $5 million to promote it, whereas the opponents have spent not anywhere near that. Uh, and it is, by the little polling that has been done, losing and losing badly. So California has this vision of being a progressive state. But historically, when we look at ballot measures that seek to regulate or to govern on issues of race, California is and remains a liberal, racist state. All right. Uh, that's all for me. Uh, there was a lot on the chat. I will look at see what was there. But I'm going to turn this over to Professor Jairaman and take my share down. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Professor Cohen. Really important proposition to look at um, and really relates to in many ways to what I want to talk about today or this week with um, uh, political strategy and thinking about, um, you know, the race class narrative that Professor uh, Ian Haney Lopez is going to come talk to us about on Wednesday. And in general, um, how we how we 
how we think about this country and messaging, uh, especially with regard to progressive values, um, both in terms of race and in terms of class, and frankly, in terms of everything else that needs to happen to save this planet. Um, you were asked to read um, about 130 pages from Ian Haney Lopez's book, Merge Left, and we're gonna be really lucky to have Professor Lopez with us on Wednesday talking to you about the race class narrative. So I don't wanna spend a ton of time uh, on the book because he'll get obviously speak to it much more deeply. I do wanna cover some of the basic themes of the book and then get into um, how the Democrats thus far have been thinking about messaging and political strategy when it comes to race and class um, and what it means for us, not just uh, not just for this election, but but post this election going into next year. But let's start with what you read in Merge Left. Uh, I just want to review some of the key points of Professor Lopez's book, which I'm sure he'll get into in much depth, much more depth on Wednesday. But um, hopefully you you caught some of these basic things. So you know, Professor Lopez puts out that in both his original book, his first book dog whistle politics and merge left, um, that the right has had a core narrative now for many, many decades. The right's core narrative around race and class is really three things, he says. Fear and distrust people of color. They are violent, lazy, and undeserving. Um, obviously, they don't say that directly. That is said through dog whistles. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just thinking of the, I don't know if everybody saw the SNL um, remake of the debate where they literally had President Trump, Alec Baldwin as President Trump with a literal dog whistle. <laughs> um, but it, you know, I think at this point, some people have said, and, and even Professor Lopez has said, it's gone far beyond a dog whistle, which you know, the whole idea of a dog whistle is that only dogs can hear it, right? It's, 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 a, it's a whistle that you blow in and humans can't hear it because the frequency is too high dogs can hear it. And so the idea of a dog whistle in talking about race is that you use coded language and that people who agree with your racist view of the world will hear the coded language and understand what you're talking about as a dog would hear a whistle, but humans can't, um, and understand that you are trying to put out a racist message without saying racist things. Um, and if you read Dog Whistle Politics, there's actually a whole way, Professor Lopez says, there's a whole way in which those that blow the dog whistle do it. They use the dog whistle. And then when they are accused of racism, there is a, how dare you accuse me of racism? I'm the least racist person in the room, as you heard Professor, I mean, Professor, oh my God, President Trump say <laughs> um, uh, in the debate. That is not him saying I'm the least racist person in the room was textbook dog whistle politics. It was it's not something unique. It's not something different that he did there. If you read dog whistle politics, which was written long before President Trump was elected, it is how people who use dog whistles operate. So this core narrative, fear and distrust, peer, people of color, they are violent, lazy and undeserving. It's not something they say overtly. They say it through coded language or the dog whistle Two distrust the government. The government spends too much money on providing individuals who are lazy with welfare and they refuse to control or rein in people of color. So distrust the government, big government is bad, right? That has been a major push of uh, the right for such a long time, big government is bad. And then three, trust the marketplace. Um, the marketplace will reward hardworking people, AKA white people who work hard. Um, and that will uh, ultimately be the right thing and save us. So he, he puts out these three arguments of the right. He then puts out this idea that actually he didn't come up with, but his co-researcher, Anat Schenker or Sorio, who I'm gonna talk a lot about more in a few minutes and a little bit, um, really has done a lot of work on, which is there's this idea that we have these three groups, what we would call the base of people who are progressive and aligned with progressive values, persuadables who can be persuaded towards progressive values, and then the opposition, which is 
uh, the hard right, essentially, people who voted for Donald Trump. And even among those, there are persuadables, but people who aren't moving, they would call the opposition. And what both Professor Lopez wrote in the book and what Anat has said for a very long time, Anat is a communications messaging expert who I'll talk about more. She's actually a graduate of the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley and a friend of mine. Um, she has uh, written a lot, spoken a lot, written books about this idea that the country actually does trend progressive. So if you put a, num a, a huge majority of the persuadables together with the base of people who are progressive, the majority does trend progressive even before 2016. Um, the opposition that is pro-Trump and you know starkly racist or starkly kind of anti-progressive is only about 23% of the country, non-persuadable people. That's what Anat would say after many years of research with various groups of people and what Professor Lopez is kind of putting out there, even among white people, the opposition at most is hardest at 23%. Um, he goes through a whole chapter talking about how the kind of the base messaging of racial justice uh, you know, racist, structural racism, historical and structural racism, he claims doesn't work for either white people or people of color. Keep in mind, this book was written before this year and the, you know, mass uprising around Black Lives Matter. So we should ask him on Wednesday whether he thinks things have changed with regard to that messaging. But he says that it, it hasn't largely worked in the past, that sort of broad, it hasn't worked to tell a broad swath of persuadables, talk to them broadly about structural racism and historical racism. And so that leave that has left Democrats with two options, either don't talk about race at all, or talk about race differently. And until recently, he says, Democrats have chosen don't talk about race at all. And in fact, talks about uh, Bernie Sanders and even Robert Reich here at UC Berkeley um, talking about race as and scapegoating, in particular scapegoating groups of color as, um, as just a symptom of economic insecurity. And, and Professor Lopez really, you know, questions that, critiques that idea that racism increases during moments of economic insecurity because white people, especially white people who are feeling economically insecure, scapegoat people of color. I just wanna pause and make sure we all know what we mean by scapegoating. Um, I'm not a Christian, so others can correct me on chat, but you know what I understand that this, this comes from the Bible, this idea of two goats, uh, one goat that was sacrificed and another living scapegoat that was released into the wilderness, taking with it all the sins and impurities. So the idea is, the scapegoat is the goat on which we put all of the sins, all of the problems, all of our blame. Um, and that goat is the goat that takes all of that blame with it. Um, you know, the idea of scapegoating people of color during times of economic hardship is that we are all being sacrificed. We being white people are being sacrificed. We are suffering economic hardship and we're gonna scapegoat people of color for creating that economic hardship. They're taking our jobs, they're lowering wages. Um, so that's the idea of scapegoating. And Robert Reich and Bernie Sanders have, have said this before that you see this increase in racism as a result of scapegoating during times of, that white people are experiencing economic insecurity. But Professor Lopez critiques this idea to say, if that were the case, then the solution would be purely and solely economic. Then we would only talk about raising wages, re reducing in in income inequality. We would not be looking at any solutions that are race specific. We would be looking at solutions that are race neutral. Um, so he really questions that. And he, he obviously, you know, from reading the book, hopefully that his solution is not to not talk about race or not to say it's a race neutral solution, but rather we need a race class narrative that both names race and identifies the villains in a race class narrative as a purposefully trying to divide people. Um, and the, I, the reason why not talking about race, part of the reason why not talking about race doesn't work or hasn't worked for the Democrats, Professor Lopez says, is because the right is talking about race all the time. 
with the dog whistle. They've been talking about race for decades. It's a, it's honestly a lot of what they talk about. You know, I told you that I, in a previous semester, had my students go interview Trump voters to understand why they voted for Trump. And most were white, the interviewees, and almost all of them named race as a number one reason that they were voting for Trump. And so not talking about race when the opposition is constantly talking about race has not worked. And so that brings Professor Lopez to the race class narrative um, where he says, we can't not talk about race. We have to talk about race differently. We have to talk about race as, um, as an, intentional, an intentional tool of the elites to keep us apart and that people of color have suffered more than others, but that we're all suffering as a result of this intentional use of racism by the elites. So we'll hear Professor Lopez talk a lot more about what that means, get into how maybe it's changed with Black Lives Matter um, and, and what it means also for messaging in the election and beyond. But I wanted to share a little bit about how that whole idea has played out over the last four or five years with regard to democratic political strategy and messaging because I fortunately or unfortunately was a little bit in the middle of all of it as it went down over the last four years. Um, so you've all seen this map, President Trump's favorite map, his favorite document. He loves to bring it out whenever he can. Um, you know, you saw so much of the Electoral College go for Trump. And when this happened in 2016, the Democrats spent, and I, when I keep saying Democrats, I don't mean the voters, I mean the party. I mean the Democratic National Committee. I mean the party headed by Tom Perez. I mean Democratic operatives spent a lot of time, money, and energy agonizing about what did we do wrong, particularly with regard to the white working class. What did we do wrong? How did we get this wrong? And so many people had so many different narratives. Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of what their focus was was on communications and messaging. And I I want to say name that because sometimes with political strategy and political pundits, so much of what they think the solution is is about changing the message, changing the narrative, changing the communication strategy. And obviously that's important. But as we've been talking about throughout this semester, so much changes public narrative other than communications experts and communications work and narrative that's pushed from pundits and communications peoples. Social movements change narratives. Social movements change public opinion. And we're going to talk more about that. But, you know, as is typical for kind of the political elites, they weren't thinking about social movements. They weren't thinking about um, you know, in policy even, they were thinking about narrative. What did we get wrong with the narrative? And, and I wanna name in particular somebody who played a big role in all of this, um, somebody who I'm, I happen to know and has worked with me and I've worked with him, a man named John Neffinger. John Neffinger was the DNC communications director um, he prepared all of the speakers for the 2016 Democratic National Convention. Um, he has, he is, uh, you know, in Democratic circles, kind of the guru on messaging. He trained lots of people in speaking to media, and he was hired by the Ford Foundation to train me in media as well. And he's trained candidates. He trained Hillary Clinton. He trained everybody in how to speak, how to talk, how to reach people, what kind of messages work. Um, and obviously not, not everything he said was listened to or taken, not everything that he did was said was right, but I do think it's helpful to just parse out a little bit of where John Neffinger is coming from and where the Democratic Party kind of is thinking with regard to communications and messaging because it impacted political strategy. So there are two books that John Neffinger points to as kind of having um, really a lot of impact on him and a lot of communications experts on persuasion. One is Cialdini. Robert Cialdini wrote a very, very uh, incredibly popular book many decades ago, long before the 2016 election called Influence. 
Um, and then Daniel Kahneman wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And these two books really influenced John Neffinger, have really influenced people in the communications messaging world. And so I thought it, it would be important to take some time to understand them. I'm not saying that all of this is right. Clearly, the Democrats lost in 2016, but there is a lot in here that's useful to think about. So Cialdini is best known for his six principles of persuasion. Um, this, as I said, wrote many decades ago, so it's not like this came out of 2016, but there's a lot in here that really does resonate with regard to what happened in 2016 and after 2016. So the principles of persuasion come from this basic idea that Cialdini puts out that human beings, the way that we think, we take what he calls shortcuts. Um, we, we make snap judgments uh, and that's a shortcut. We make snap judgments based on things like appearance or things like uh, our personal affinity to a candidate or to an issue. Um, and he said there are, in, in thinking about persuading people, there are six key things to think about with regard to having those shortcuts move people in a certain direction, influencing people using those shortcuts. Um, one big kind of uh, overarching theme around the shortcuts is the contrast principle. It's a little bit kind of similar to what Professor Cohen and I have talked about in the past with regard to, you know, what is the center of political, you know, this political spectrum changes over time. And the contrast principle essentially says that if you can make something look very extreme, then the thing that's less extreme appears to be the center. The center. So the right, if the right can put forward a very radical right perspective, then what is far right can appear the center, even though it's the far right. So the contrast principle is one overarching theme with regard to persuasion and shortcuts. But there are six key principles he goes through keeping that, those overarching themes in mind. The first is reciprocation. The idea is that you give back in kind when you receive an unexpected gift. So um, people who feel like they've gotten something from Donald Trump, a $1,200 check, a huge tax cut, there's an idea of reciprocity in most people's minds that, I mean, it's, it's, these are very common sense things, but it's what communications and narrative people use to think about how they're gonna communicate with voters, how they're gonna communicate with the populace. So reciprocity is this idea that you give something to people and they feel some sense of, I have to give back. And one of the, uh, one of the principles underneath re reciprocity is the idea of rejection than retreat. If Donald Trump puts out a very extreme idea, um, lock her up, lock them all up, but then retreats from that and all you end up with is an investigation or the notion that Biden has done something wrong, corrupt, illegal. There's a sense of reciprocity in that, in that people feel like, well, we didn't give him the lock her up. We didn't lock them up. We didn't investigate them. But we feel some, because we didn't give that, we're gonna recipro re uh, reciprocate by at least allowing for, there's corruption, at least allowing for um, the, the, the retreat, which is, okay, we're not gonna lock them up, but we are gonna assume that they did something wrong. So rejection then retreat is a kind of subset under reciprocity, but there's a lot more you can do with reciprocity in making people feel like they have something to reciprocate, a gift a give, something that makes people feel like they have to give back. The second is commitment, the desire to maintain consistency in what you've already said or done. This has been one of the Democrats' greatest challenges with regard to people who voted for Trump. It's very hard for people to feel like they are inconsistent, that they've made a mistake, that they've done something wrong. Um, and a lot of this has to do with making people feel like if they're gonna change their mind, it's based on their own inner choice, not based on something that somebody else has told them to do, not based on somebody else telling them you made a mistake, but an inner choice that they've made, something they've done without outside pressure. So a big part of the thinking for Democrats has been 
or the Democratic National Committee has been, how do you get people to feel like they're still consistent with what they believed in and their values, um, even if they're changing parties, even if they decide not to vote for Donald Trump again. Social proof, this is a big one. Um, people tend to, according to Cialdini, vote and, and make, have preferences, especially if they're unsure about things, they tend to make choices and snap decisions, shortcuts based on what people around them are doing. Imitation, um, what people they respect and admire, their social community are doing. That seems pretty, um, pretty straightforward. Liking, um, people prefer to say yes to people they like or resembles them or shares their same values. And there've been a lot of talk about why Working class people really like Donald Trump. They feel like he's straightforward. They felt like he was different from the politicians they had seen before. Um, authority. There is a, you know, psychological, according to Cialdini, many decades before Trump, um, tendency to respond well to symbols of authority rather than substance, that authority trumps substance. Anybody who puts themselves out there as an authority trumps the substance of what they're saying. And lastly, scarcity. The idea that uh, economic and social improvement, so, so things, are, things are more rare, things are more precious if they're scarce. And that includes not just money, not just assets, not just things you can buy, but also time, quantity, and space. Um, and so if people have experienced a certain mobility, for example, if white people have experienced mobility for a long time, and then they're not experiencing mobility, it becomes uh, way more precious. Um, and there's, there's more of a agitated desire to save that thing that we once had and we no longer have it. So these are, these are some of the basic tenets that Cialdini and therefore John Neffinger and therefore the DNC have been thinking about over the last couple of years in terms of how to move voters, particularly that persuadable group, not the base, not the opposition, but that persuadable group. And frankly, even some of the opposition. I think a lot of people would criticize the Democrats and the DNC as being very focused in trying to get some of that opposition back. So the second uh, book that I mentioned is Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, another huge source for John Neffinger and the, and the DNC of how to think about how voters think. And Daniel Kahneman talks about two systems, system one and system two. System one is, these are two types of thinking in every person's brain, according to Daniel Kahneman, who's an economist, um, but a lot, of, a lot of what he's written about has been social behavior and communication and persuasion. So system one is the shortcuts. It's when we jump to a conclusion. It's the fast, thinking fast. System two is thinking slow. That's when you allow yourself to have nuance. It's when you allow yourself to think more deeply about an issue or perhaps even change your mind, which is rare. We, most of the time, are operating in system one. We make quick we jump to conclusions, we make quick uh, decisions. And system one is very focused on emotions and what they call the halo effect. If you like somebody like President Trump, you'll like his, you like his voice, you like his appearance, you'll like his policies. There's kind of a halo effect that occurs, you know, and a framing effect also they talk about that um, different ways of presenting the very same information can evoke very different emotions. So system one is very emotions based. It's very quick. It's a very snap judgment. It's often based on appearance and, uh, and just your initial reaction to somebody or some policy and the way it's presented. So framing effects that people think about in this world are this, I don't even know if they, you know, W-Y-S-I-A-T-I, -I, which stands for what you see is all there is, which is that most people make decisions based on very little info and they actually don't want more information that will spoil their story of, of what they think. So have you all, I don't know if you all have seen, I watch a lot of Trevor Noah. I don't know, have you seen um, Trevor Noah's guy who goes and interviews people at Trump rallies, I'm forgetting his name, Jordan Clapper, 
Jordan Clapper is his name. He goes and interviews people at Trump rallies and they say things about Trump and he says something that directly contradicts what they think about Trump, a fact or a reality or, or some piece of information and they clearly can't process it or don't process it or it doesn't matter because they've made their decision and they don't want other facts that spoil their full story of who they think Donald Trump is and what Donald Trump represents. So this, what you see is all there is, is this is also based on snap judgments. Law of small numbers. This was a big one that, um, that the Democrats really kind of spent a lot of time bemoaning about, which is that people tend to make decisions based on their own limited view or world experience, and they focus on stories rather than statistics. So, so much of the left and Democrats have spent a lot of time producing data producing stats, producing research. I'm at the Goldman School. There's a very heavy emphasis on that, that the way you move policy is by quantita rigorous quantitative analysis. That's what matters. And clearly that's, that wasn't what mattered in 2016. And even in the years following the election, there was even a, a cover of Time Magazine, right? Does truth matter at all? because so much of what the right was able to do is, is really ignore statistics, ignore facts, ignore data, and instead focus on stories, instead focus on anything that would you know, drive emotion. And the law of small numbers says that people will remember, listen to, and be moved by individual stories way more than they will be by statistics because people are guided more so by emotion than by reason. They're easily swayed by details, according to Daniel Kahneman, and um, they are uh, not sensitive to, they don't really care about low and high probabilities. Like probability of this story being the common story doesn't matter. It's the story that matters. I, I myself had a very real experience of this a few weeks ago. I was asked by Congress to testify in the US House Ways and Means Committee. And it was about the restaurant industry. And it was me and a worker, I may have already told you this, but let me just finish, um, and two, two restaurant owners. Um, <laughs> and one of the restaurant owners was a Vietnamese refugee who had, who was like a stockbroker, some you know professional uh, uh, finance person who went blind due to a disease and then learned how to cook and then won a, a competition top chef or one of these competitions and then opened her own restaurant. And so <laughs> this was a majority democratic congressional committee. And we were talking about the restaurant industry. We were talking about the fact that so many workers, millions of workers are out of work. This is in a house ways and means committee on the restaurant industry. And 90% of the questions and comments after I testified and the worker testified and these employers testified, 90% of the comments and questions were directed at this woman and her story of having gone blind and then winning, winning Top Chef. Because to them, it was such a deeply moving story that trumped everything else we were talking about and represented, you know, the great American pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mythology and was a beautiful moving story and they and they spent most of the hearing directing questions and comments at her. So the law of small numbers um, is obvious and also um, hasn't been that obvious, honestly. It hasn't been that obvious to Democrats who focus so much of their attention on statistics and data and, uh, and, and thinking that policy moves exclusively by reason and by logic and by um, and by evidence. So the second part of Daniel's book is about overconfidence. Um, it's this idea that a compelling narrative can create this illusion of inevitability. So not only can good stories, not only are good stories the things that people remember over data, but they can help uh, move entire, a, a whole narrative. And, and it's part of this conviction, he says, that the world makes sense and it rests on a secure foundation. These are his words, not mine. Our almost unlimited ability to ignore our ignorance. 
So it's part of this idea of what you see is, is all there is. We hear a story, we think that's, that's so moving, that's what I believe in. And any other data that comes my way, I'm so overconfident that this is the right way to think, I'm gonna ignore this other data. Okay, he also talks about choices, when we have to make choices, like when we vote, um, the brain tends to respond more to symbolic threats, more so than positive messaging, which is why so much of, you know, political strategy has been focused on negative threats, war and crime. They attract attention faster than happy words like peace and love. Um, even if there's not a real threat, they're gonna kill the suburbs is a reminder of a bad event that triggers system one thinking. And it's not necessarily working now, but it has worked in the past. And bad events that people experience have, um, you know, have really triggered their thinking. However, on the other hand, he said, there is something that most people do follow, which is the fairness principle. People do have a sense of fairness. And we've seen, I've seen that in poll after poll after poll, that despite all of this, still people have a basic sense of fairness and that symbolic threats, like they're going to destroy the suburbs, can be overcome by people's basic sense of fairness, which supersedes their profit maximizing principle. This is important because this book was written by a fairly well known economist. And you know, economists believe that all behavior or that the whole, all of economics is based on the notion that people act in purely rational ways, maximizing profit. But even Daniel Kahneman says fairness in poll after poll after poll. Polls show that for most Americans, for most people, there is a fairness principle that can supersede notions of profit maximization. And it does actually directly contradict the economy, economics principle that people are ruled entirely by self-interest um, and, and, and rationality. All right, the last piece of this book that I think it's important to lift up is this idea of two selves. They talk about how um, our memory of an experience. So we live, we live our life, we have our worldview based on our experience, but our memory of that experience can be heightened or exaggerated and different from the actual lived experience. And memory is a function of system one thinking that is, you know, is different from the reality often. And it can be more or less painful than the experience itself because the experience is the experience. The memory is connected to emotions and feelings and the halo effect and so many other things that you see in front of you on this slide that affects how you remember an experience. And this does end up impacting people's worldview, their political view, their view on race, their view on class, their memory of how something happened is connected to values and emotions in a way that isn't necessarily reality. So all of this, both Cialdini's book and Daniel's Commons book had, had been real bases for how Democrats were thinking about what do we do? And their takeaway from all of that was still to think about all of that and to focus so much on the white working class, to focus so much on what did we get wrong with the white working class? And people like Joan Williams, um, who wrote a book about the white working class, and this is from the Harvard Business Review, um, you know, got a lot of attention saying, Democrats, you got it wrong because you didn't focus. You, you notice the title of this article is not what so many people don't get about the white working class. It's what so many people don't get about the US working class. Because as Professor Cohen has talked about, there's been such a, uh, a an assumption that when we talk about working class people, we're talking about white working class people, which of course is not the US working class at all anymore, but so much attention based on these kind of theories of influence, theories of communication was focused on what did we do wrong with the white working class and, uh, and how can we do different, do better by the white working class. Um, and in particular, she has this section of this article and her book where she says, we must avoid the temptation to write off blue collar resentment as racism. And you know, she writes in a very, in my opinion, racist way herself that um, you know, people think that all of all of that, all of their votes, all of 
the white working class's votes for Trump, those who voted for Trump was about racism, but she says that is intellectual comfort food and it is dangerous. She says that, um, you know, she defends the police as a, as a white working class institution. Um, she says that, uh, you know, we need to focus on class essentially as, as others have said. And um, in particular, she kind of touts herself as saying that when she's gone around speaking about these issues, the Democrats and Democratic operatives, she, she said the woman, she spoke at the Kennedy School at Harvard, a woman who ran the speaker series and major Democratic operative like my talk. She said, you said, you are saying exactly what the Democrats need to hear, she mused, and they'll never listen. I hope now they will. So there was a lot of Democratic operatives who bought into this idea that, you know, we're, we need to use these Cialdini and common kind of persuasion messaging tricks to think about how we're going to persuade the opposition, the white working class. And of course, there was pushback to that. There was definitely pushback to that from a lot of different people. Um, Vanessa Williams was, uh, you know, wrote this article, but there were many others about, you know, you're saying identity politics has run its course. You're saying that Democrats have you know, focus too much on identity politics and therefore lost the white working class. Uh, and, you know, what Vanessa says in this article and many other people said is not focusing on identity politics is in fact identity politics because it's simply focusing on white people instead of other people of color. So of course, Professor Lopez, as you'll hear more on Wednesday, comes out of all of this saying all of this was wrong the focus on the white working class entirely was wrong. The idea of focusing on class entirely was wrong, that there has to be a narrative that combines class and race. Um, and this was all, of course, before the movement for black lives really erupted this year. So even before any of this happened, Anat Schenker Osorio, who was Ian's part, Professor Lopez's partner in doing the research along with Demos, which is a major nonprofit uh, working on these issues. Anat had been writing and speaking for many years about the need to stop focusing on the opposition uh, entirely, stop focusing on the persuadables and think about the base. And she wrote this article um, talking about, you know, the Democrats and this Aesop fable called uh, about the donkey and going to market. I don't know how many people are familiar with this fable, but it's a, it's a story in which a boy and his father are taking a donkey to market um, and they're walking with the donkey and then people laugh at them. Why, why are you walking the donkey? Why aren't you riding the donkey? So then they put the boy on the donkey and then people laugh at them. Oh, you horrible young man. Why are you letting your elderly father walk? You know, and so they switch and then the father gets on the donkey and then they criticize, oh, you old man, why are you walking and not letting your son also ride? Why are you riding and not letting your son also ride? So they both get on the donkey, then people criticize them. How are you overloading this poor donkey? So they get off the donkey and carry the donkey. And when they carry the donkey, the donkey falls and dies, um, falls into a ravine and dies. So it's the idea of that please all and you'll please none. If you try to make everybody happy, you'll please nobody. And this has been, a Knott's critique of the Democrats long before the Trump election, that there's such a desire to, as she says, simply um, simply take the temperature, right? What she says, what we've done for so long is that we've just basically tried to have the most milk toast possible message. Democrats have tried to have the most milk toast message that everybody can feel good about, and in the end, really mobilizes, inspires, agitates no one because it's so milk toast. So uh, the Democrats have been so long to put out this idea that in fact, what they've been based on all the messaging research I just shared with you, their idea coming out of that was to say economic, we need an economic growth that will benefit all Americans. That has been the, the notion growth, growth, growth. We need a growth that will benefit all Americans. Um, and it's kind of a milk toast argument that is basically based on the idea of let's meet people where they're at and actually say nothing at all. Let's just meet people where they're at and say nothing. And a Knott's critique of messaging experts who have done this is to say, 
our job as communicators is not to take the temperature, it's to move the needle, it's to push people. It's not to say, where are we? Let's just speak to where people are. It's to actually move people to a different place. And, um, you know, so she, she, she has critiqued the Democratic Party on this for a very long time and talking about inequality as an, and as an abstraction or growth as an abstraction doesn't really work at all. Um, she says a winning message names what it's like for people struggling to make ends meet and then what we plan to actually do about it. And it actually includes naming the very people created origins of these inequalities and the solutions that are based on those people created solutions. So one of the things Anat often talks about is there's just too much passive voice. We Passive voice is used so, um, we are, it's so overused among Democrats to say inequality exists, um, you know, poverty exists, or uh, uh, we need we need we need growth for all, rather than saying rather than naming the protagonists that have driven the inequality. So rather than saying inequality exists, you can say corporations and corporate control of our democracy has driven inequality. Um, or you can, you can talk about how corporations and corporate control of our democracy has meant growth for some and not for others. So she has talked about a lot about how she's critiqued these democratic pundits and democratic messengers by saying the use of passive voice, the use of milk toast uh, kind of language has resulted in motivating no one. And long before Ian's book, she was sharing how so many of Sorry, Professor Lopez's book. Long before Professor Lopez's book, she was sharing how so much of the country does swing progressive and is not motivated by um, milk toast language. So this is kind of the numbers. If you even out the the bar graph, the the, the graphs that you saw in the book merge left between uh, Black, Latinx, and white voters, and how they break down in terms of a progressive base opposition or persuadable, if you average them, you end up with about 55% of the country being um, persuadable, 20 to 23% being opposition, and 25% or so being base. And so if this is true, when the Democrats are milk toast, when they have a milk toast, when everybody know what we mean by when we say milk toast, just a very bland, non, uh, it doesn't say anything actually real because there's such a fear to talk about race. Race and gender were so third rail for so long. We want to focus on the shortcuts. We want to focus on system one thinking. Everything that I've gone through, the idea was, let's just focus on shortcuts and system one thinking. Let's be milk toast so that we don't offend anybody. We don't drive away anybody. And what Anat has said is that that inspires no one. And that resulted in Donald Trump, that in fact, the best thing to do is to have inspiring messaging that names the protagonists in the situations that we're in and that motivates your base to actually go vote and drive some of the people in the persuasion in the persuadable category towards you so much of the strategy of the democrats has been let's not let's try to get some of that opposition though that white working class that's in the in the orange triangle. Let's try to get some of that orange triangle. Let's not piss them off. Let's be as milk toast as possible and see if we can get some of those folks. What Anat has said is the opposite, that you need language that's inspiring and motivating. And frankly, because the country tends progressive, progressive, and then you're gonna be able to motivate your base, get some of the um, get some of the persuadable and anger the opposition. Anat says, if you're not angering the opposition, you are not doing your job as a communicator. You are simply taking the temperature. You are not actually moving the base. And so what ended up happening, she said, in her opinion, the fact that people didn't turn out is because the base wasn't motivated and the, and the persuadables went to Donald Trump because they had a more, uh, in some cases, some, some persuadables went to Donald Trump because there was a message that was more motivating, more agitating, more inspiring than the milk toast message of the Democrats. So um, 
this is all communication strategy. I am not a communication strategist. I don't come from the world of thinking that it's all about narrative. I'm an organizer. I come from the world of social movements. And what we know is that, yes, the country is moving left. There is a, a progressive tendency of our base, but it's not entirely as a result of communications and messaging. It doesn't change because communicators change their strategy. It changes also because of social movements. It changes also because of organizing and that it's not all about changing the narrative and knowing about Cialdini's book and Daniel Common's book and knowing about influence and persuasion. It is about, it is about uh, people organizing as well. So this is an article that came out last week by David Brooks, a conservative columnist in the New York Times, um, who I think, you know, as much as he's problematic, the fact that even he is recognizing that the country is moving to the left and that a lot of the conservative theorists that he names in this piece um, are pretty right wing and are also saying the country is moving to the left is pretty significant. Um, and it's not that everybody he says is becoming Democrats, but that there's some basic assumptions that a lot of the country is accepting now, in particular, that big government is not bad. And particularly in a pandemic, we need government to step in and do things like create a plan, have health care, be able to take care of people. Um, and in fact, this was based on a poll from the New York Times that showed that two thirds of Americans actually support allowing people to get health insurance through the federal government, the public option. That two thirds support Biden's $2 trillion renewable energy plan. That 72% of likely voters, including 56% of Republicans support to another 2 trillion in COVID-19 relief to individuals as well as to state and local governance. So um, he is saying it's true you know, the pand not just the pandemic prior to the pandemic, but now definitely the pandemic has moved people to the left. Um, and now 59% now, uh, of Americans think government should be doing more to solve people's problems. So we started at the beginning of today talking about uh, Lopez saying that the right has had an argument about big government is bad for so long. And, and essentially David Brooks is saying um, and other conservative theorists are saying that argument is over and, and government is needed. Um, but we don't get there and pass there simply through messaging. Obviously the pandemic has had a big part of this, but so have social movements. So, um, you know, when we in social movement theory and in organizing theory think about moving people, we're not thinking about the kinds of things that we talked about earlier today. We're not thinking about the shortcuts. We're not thinking about system one thinking and system two thinking. We are thinking about the bridges that people have to cross to get from where they are to where we need them to be to fight for progressive change. And in particular, we talk about three barriers that when you start organizing, you need people to get over from one side of the bridge to the other. The three biggest barriers to collective action for progressive change are is fear, apathy, and isolation. And a lot of people think the way to overcome fear is through anger. And organizers over the years have felt that no, actually hope is a stronger way to overcome fear. And, you know, I'm gonna give actually one example from a communications standpoint, and then I'm gonna give one example from an organizing standpoint. So from a communication standpoint, Anat often talks about the movie, No. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, No. Um, it's, it was an international movie about the overthrow of the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile. It's a, it's a, it's a good movie, you should see it. <laughs> it's a fun movie, um, interesting movie. And basically the movie is about a moment in Chilean history when international pressure, Pinochet was a dictator, took over a socialist government led by Allende, um, you know, in the 70s through a coup um, that America supported. And he was a military dictator, took over, you know, controlled the country for decades. Finally, based on international pressure, agreed to have a vote, a plebiscite, a referendum in which the people would say whether 
it was time for uh, an election and you know open open ability for somebody else to be president other than or you know other than Pinochet and the opposition the folks that were saying yes we need the ability to have an election were given a 15 minute spot every night at midnight um, for several weeks leading up to the vote and at first if you watch the movie I mean it's romanticized but for, at first the coalition of people fighting for democracy in Pinochet wanted to run ads that were that showed the horror of the Pinochet dictatorship, people getting killed, people getting beaten up, people getting their hands cut off, people getting, you know, I, you know, many, many tortures of the Pinochet government, you know, physical torture, emotional torture. So they wanted to show all of that for 15 minutes every night at midnight to get people to vote that we need to get rid of Pinochet, we need a vote. Um, but they brought in a communications expert from the corporate world who said, no, we shouldn't do that. Instead, we should present the hope of, and the joy that could come from a new democratic Chile. And they agreed to that. The coalition agreed to that. And in the end, uh, they ran these 15 minute segments every night showing families and picnics and how great a glory and glorious a democratic Chile could be, you know, people having fun, people enjoying themselves. Um, and that won out and, and they won. They were able to have a, an election. So I don't want to tell you the whole story. You should see the movie. But the point that Anat makes from this movie is that um, hope is a way to overcome fear that's, that's more, that is actually more effective than anger. You need anger. You need anger to, to get people to act. But when they're in a place of fear, the idea that something can be better than what it is right now is what helps people overcome fear. And from an organizing standpoint, this is what we do when we talk to workers who are afraid to stand up when their boss is exploiting them. This is what we talk to. This is how we talk to people who are afraid to stand up because they're afraid of losing their job or they're an immigrant, afraid of being deported or for whatever reason they are afraid. Um, and you know that so much of Trump's success has been based on fear, fear, fear. And the idea that we use in organizing is to show people that things can be different, things can be better, that if you organize, you could actually have a $15 wage, you could actually have a union, you'd have the right to come together whenever there are problems on the job, you'd have the right to speak up if you're feeling that something's unsafe or you don't, you can't come to work, you need a, a day off. So giving people the sense that things could be different, it's just a quick example, we, um, I remember about 15 years ago, a group of immigrant workers walked into our office and said, you know, uh, they're taking out of our paychecks to pay for our uniforms. And we, and, and we, wanna, we wanna do something about it, but we're afraid, we don't wanna lose our jobs. And we said, um, that's horrible that they're charging you for your uniforms, that's actually illegal, they can't take that out of your paycheck, but what else do you want you know, it, to change in your workplace? And they said, what do you mean? We said, well, what about having the right to a paid sick day, the right to take a day off and be paid for it? And they said, what's a paid sick day? They'd never, uh, they, they'd never heard of that. They'd never thought of that. And so we presented all of these other possibilities for what could change if they organized and they ended up organizing and they ended up winning all of those things. So that's how we in organizing do it. We help, we help people see a different future than what they uh, can see in, in a place of fear. But we do use anger to help people overcome apathy. We do use anger to help people move from a place of, you know what, I don't care, I'm not involved. And you are seeing, Professor Cohen at the start of this, this class talked about millions of people in early voting. You are seeing millions of people right now acting out of anger in ways that they wouldn't have in the past because they felt the elections meant nothing to them or voting meant nothing to them. And then the last barrier is isolation. The idea that I'm, I'm all by myself, there's nothing I can do. You can overcome that by that we're in it together. So this is what we use through organizing. And, and I think my point in this is that so much of democratic political strategy has been based on this communications expertise and this idea that we have to worry about the white working class, worry about the opposition, um, when a lot of organizing is about mobilizing our own base, and moving persuadables by mobilizing our own base and doing all of that by focusing on a future that is not milk toast, but is very real and is very progressive. 
and not being afraid to be bold in that progressivism because that is essentially what's happened to the Democratic Party for so long. There's a fear of being too progressive, too bold for fear of alienating uh, another side to the extent that it results in nobody being motivated at all. Um, and I, I mean, we're going through this right now on federal minimum wage. I'm part of a huge coalition of groups working on federal minimum wage. There is a real fear of rocking the boat. There is a real fear of not asking for more than uh, you know what they think is politically possible. Not thinking about how you might actually move the conversation through organizing or social movements. So I'm going to stop sharing and just say that the. 2018 election, I think, was another moment in which there was a referendum on the Democratic Party and the fear of progressivism and the fear of progressive values that was really kind of kicked to the curb by the election of the squad and lots of folks that came in and didn't just represent a new demographic, but frankly represented a new progressive kind of set of values. Um, and that, and that I think continues to this day. There is, as we're seeing, this swing to the left. We're going to talk about it more with Professor Lopez. And the question is, how far can you go? Because the one, again, Professor Lopez wrote his book prior to the Movement for Black Lives um, and has said in writing the book that he did not think that being very outwardly forthright on structural racism or for example, talking about the history of the legacy of slavery would work, that it didn't work with in what he saw with focus groups with white voters or with people of color voters. But we saw a social movement create the na nation's openness, more openness to reckon with history, to reckon with structures of racism. And so we know that social movements can, can move people in ways that messaging by themselves cannot. So I will stop. Looks like Professor Cohen wants to say quite a bit, and then we can open it up to. No, I want to get your question. No, I thought that was great. Like I guess part of it is it just made me a lot of what you just laid out there explains to some degree or another the 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 failures of the Obama era, that you know the 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 his steadfast refusal to actually talk about race and and create public policy around race for sake of this kind of class-based version that, well, you know, if, if I just put in policies that are that target working people, black people will benefit by, you know, uh, by, ad you know by addition. Uh, and it, 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 it never worked. That's right. Um, this constant desire to sort of get, to win over, uh, to, to fail to alienate. Now, part of this is about a black man in politics who can't be angry, who can't be in a position to piss off the opposition. Um, but there was this steadfast belief that, oh, the Republicans will come to my side. Oh, I will be able to merge with them. That we'll, we'll have this kind of national unity. And his refusal to make people angry led to like the, the utter failure of the Obama era. That's and right. the real power of it, it seems like, and there's an outstanding piece by the political scientist Corey Robin called The Obama Knots, in which he basically read all of the memoirs of former Obama you know, um, uh, uh, people. And basically, his, he says that the real achievement of the Obama era was its failure because it established a higher benchmark of what it is the left can and should be asking for. And what, what you got as a result is the Sanders campaign. Bernie Sanders is still the most popular politician in the United States, full stop. Uh, the, the American people overwhelmingly want the things that Bernie Sanders uh, is claiming, is advocating and demanding. They over Now, they may not have liked Bernie, and Bernie as a candidate was pretty flawed in all sorts of different ways, but Americans actually want Medicare for all. Americans actually want increased taxes on rich people. Americans actually want to uh, free public higher education and an end to student loans and all those kinds of things. Um, and they want aggressive policies towards race, racial justice. Um, but it is, you know, it, it then, but then you have this Democratic Party, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Goldman Sachs and the Wall Street set that makes so much of this so difficult and impossible. Um, but I think you're right. We are in a really distinctive moment where um, now, obviously, the election returns are not in. Um, we will see, you know, we need to, you know, stop 
generating lists of future Supreme Court justices and Biden's cabinet and actually, you know, Win. get this in the bag first, because like the, that we, we don't know. Um, right. But, but, but I, oh, sorry, go ahead. But, no. but I do want to say, I think, you know, I, I, regardless of what happens with the election, I don't think that is, frankly, I do not, I would not agree that the 2016 election or whatever happens in the 2020 election is an indication of the nation's willingness or desire for progressive policies. The nation's desire for willingness and willingness for progressive policies has been firmly established. As you just said, the majority of Americans want government to intervene. They want health care. They want education. The majority of Americans want those things. But a lot of what I was going through, it, it it's true that the way those things are communicated makes all the difference in the world. And the, and the way those things are communicated isn't just about narrative strategy, it's also about social movements. Those two things do impact the way those things are communicated and the way those people un that people understand those policies. And so I just wanna tease out about the Obama era. What we are talking about, Professor Cohen and I, are is universalist or race neutral policies versus uh, intentionally, you know, racial, racially equitable policies, things that are, um, that you, that you seek, like Prop 16, that you seek to not just be neutral, not just to be universalist, but address historical racism and structural racism and name it. And even on that, which Professor Lopez in his book, which was written before the Movement for Black Lives, said, you know, is not is not doable. Even that has shifted now this year. So, the the need for and when we keep saying Democrats, I've talked about the DNC. I've talked about Tom Perez. I've talked about pundits and the people who support the DNC. It's not just them. There is a universe of Beltway organizations that I work with on a daily basis, like the Center for American Progress, which was founded by John Podesta, and. Um, a universe of beltway organizations that are working on minimum wage and healthcare and all of these issues that are honestly just as moderate and scared of progressivism as uh as as the democratic party so it, it, there's an infrastructure it's not just the party there's an infrastructure of democratic leaning organizations that even now even as even conservative thinkers are saying you know, the country's moving in a progressive direction, still can't move out of the notion of being milk toast. still have a hard time moving towards progressive values. So let's let Determined to be out of step and out of touch, <laughs> utterly <laughs> exactly. determined to lose uh, every election they could possibly stand to contest. Um, <laughs> right. No, I mean, I, 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 those, I think those points are, are very well taken. I think you're, you're quite right. And there is this kind of large scale um, institutional paralysis within the the kind of Democratic Party that just seems incapable of addressing these kinds of new constituencies, and which is why I think someone like the Obama administration, the Obama campaign, actually did succeed in part because it modeled itself as a social movement. It you know it it presented itself as one. Now we can debate on whether or not they qualified or not, but it certainly tried to present itself as such with a demand for change and to expand and uh, the electorate and to build a new coalition of new voters and uh, that it, it very much mirrored that um, that energy in the same way that um, the the Sanders campaign has done that it, it you know it's it's not me us it's this kind of expansive understanding about um, how a campaign can look like a social movement and bring new people into the process and bring new ideas into the process and that becomes um, one of the, a kind of an effective model. I think the other thing that, that I would call out, and then I want to uh, uh, go to questions here, because, um, but there's, there's really a, the question about pissing off the opposition, <laughs> right? Because um, hey, Lopez, I mean, and I should, just to clarify what I think, sorry, I would say, Sorrow's correct in the sense that this book came out before the summer's wave of Black Lives Matter protests. But of course, Black Lives Matter starts with, you know, the murder of, of Michael Brown, during the, the second half of the Obama uh, era. So it, the Black Lives Matter exists and is present in the book, but not in its sort of current uh, larger uh, crested wave here. Um, but, but the sense that um, the far right, the, 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 
you know, I think the new Supreme Court, and that is happening right now, will create a situation in which Democrats in order can thrive by attacking the um, uh, evangelical right, which is very much in, in charge. And Lopez is very clear. He's like, the evangelical right are the enemy. We should not even be talking to them. They are unpersuadable. They are the opposition. They are the enemy. We need to name them and act like they are the enemy. And like that kind of, you know, the, the Republicans win elections because they have enemies and they name the enemies and they scapegoat them. And which isn't to say that we need to scapegoat evangelicals or be anti-religious or anti-Christian, but like knowing and being able to name the opposition and building against them is an essential part of um, political messaging that the, the Democrats don't do and don't do well. Well, especially because so much of, in polling, so much of the country has named that Fairness is related to uh, a distrust and a dislike of corporate corporations and corporate control of our democracy. But Democrats are often unwilling to, to say that because they get funded by those same corporations. Many of the new Democratic Senate candidates coming in uh, are um, funded in a big part by Silicon Valley. And so their willingness to speak out against Uber and Lyft or you know any of those issues remains very low, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, but you're right. I mean, it is a. I mean, it is a social democratic country. We always have been, and we for a very long time we have. I mean, there's a famous survey that was done in the late '70s and 1980s in which they asked Americans. Um, uh, they gave them these phrases and asked them what they thought of them, and and so the the classic communist idiom of from each according to their ability to each according to their need. So the classic definition of communism, right? From each according to their ability to each according to their need. They asked random samplings of Americans what they thought of the statement. And most people who heard it thought it was so commonsensical that it was actually in the constitution. Right. So there's that, that you know, and someone like David Brooks, who is wrong about everything, literally everything. He has never been right about anything in his entire life. It will stand there and say, well, it's a center right country, but boy, we're moving left. Well, no, no, you have no evidence for that. His version of evidence is talking to a cab driver. That's, I mean, that's not, I mean, like not it, literally half of his opinion columns start with him having in a cab. Um, anyways, like, so let's, let's go to a couple, we have some good questions here. Hello, Professor. Um, so my question was uh, surrounded around the whole discussion about race and class as to, you know, uh, explanatory variables for whatever is happening in the country right now. And uh, I just wanted to hear a little more about uh, the fact that could it be, you know, uh, we were thinking about the way people react to things and the systems that react. Could it be that uh, the economic insecurity actually pushes people to have a reactionary um, you know, a, prop, a possible reaction that surrounds, you know, brings race into the conversation in the sense that in the economic insecurity right now, could it be that the COVID pandemic in some ways brought people together, but also had other people revealing more racist tendencies just because of what was happening? Yeah, that, that was what uh, I was saying that Professor Lopez was critiquing that 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 is the idea of scapegoating. That is the idea that Robert Reich and Bernie Sanders have put out this idea that racism increases in times of economic insecurity because white people feel like uh, it's easier to get white people who are economically insecure to blame others. It's easier for Donald Trump to say, oh, it's the fault of the Mexicans, they're taking our jobs, they're, rap they're rapists and criminals, um, or it's the fault of that other group. That's the idea of scapegoating. The problem with that notion is, is Professor Lopez says that the problem with that is then, okay, then the solution is to lift all boats. It's universalist. If, if we think the only problem is economic insecurity, that's the reason racism exists or gets perpetuated is because of economic insecurity, then the solution is, economic security, getting people higher wages, you know, better benefits, making sure they're economically secure. And we've seen racism, dog whistle politics exist in times of both economic depression and relative prosperity. So it cannot be the only explanatory factor, but it also cannot be the only solution because as Prof Professor Cohen just talked about, universal policies of the Obama administration that were not intentional around race did not actually push the envelope, solve the problem, 
win us the progressive policies that we really that we really needed. So in organizing, we talk about, you know, if you design a campaign around a policy, raising the minimum wage, anything, if you don't examine first the structural racism that surrounds the problem that creates the need for the policy, as well as how the policy is implemented, you will end up perpetuating structural racism. And so that's why the, the question around racism or, or the reason for racism cannot be attributed only to economic insecurity. There's also just structural and historical racism in this country that goes back a long way and is as much of its own driver as class. So I, maybe I didn't spend enough time, maybe we'll do this more on Wednesday, but all of this comes from this very live debate that I've lived for the last 20 years and many people have for much longer in America, which is, you know, when you organize, for example, when you organize workers, you are part of a labor movement that often likes to say the problem is class. It's all about class. What we need is class solidarity. Race is a red herring. It's used to divide us, but the real issue is class, class solidarity. That's what we need to focus on, organizing workers. And then there's another world we're a part of in organizing workers, that's the racial justice world. That is, um, you know, people of all different classes. It's uh, Skip Gates at Harvard getting taken by the police when he tries to enter his own home. So a very well-known distinguished professor getting uh, targeted by the police for trying to enter his own home or the, a wealthy black man in a Bentley getting pulled over because of racial profiling as much as it is um, about the, 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 the poor black person in, in the neighborhood. And, and if you think only about race, then maybe your solution is let's support black owned businesses which is great and important, but not the entire solution because there are all of these policies needed to uplift people economically that are as much about racial justice as they are about economic justice. And so this book really comes out of this debate of many years of people saying it's entirely about class, it's entirely about income, we just need to focus on uplifting all boats and not letting them use race to divide us. And another world that says it's entirely about race, that's the real issue here, and you know, let's focus on uplifting uh, people of color into the into the bourgeoisie and not think about class. I'm saying these in very simplistic terms. Forgive me, not nuanced. But what Professor Lopez is talking about, and a lot of what kind of the new left is talking about, is it's not about one or the other. These are intersectional issues and genders in there as well, and we need to be addressing all of these things at the same time. Yeah, I, I, that that. You know the the sense that uh, look anyone offering you a monocausal solution or analysis is wrong, right? It's all about class. It's all about race. Like anybody offering you a single cause or axes of redress or critique is going to be wrong, right? Uh, the, there's the the world is overdetermined in its complexity, and the, the question about racial versus economic insecurity really is this question of like. Uh, the, the the overlapping right intersectional nature of our identities. Well, do I feel working class today or do I feel white? Well, it's not you know it's both right. And so what I would argue, or what I, the, the the phrase I would argue, I would offer you, and I encourage all of you to commit this to memory, <laughs> comes from Stuart Hall, the, again the Jamaican-born British intellectual Stuart Hall, who said that race is a modality in which class is lived. Race is a modality in which class is lived. Right. So are you rich black folks have a different experience of the world. Now they'd have experiences that bind them to poorer black folks and they have experiences that separate them and, may, and create deep distinctions. Rich white people, poor white people, working class folks, right? Like there's great differentiations within these. So like race and class are always exist together simultaneously. Race is a modality in which class is lived. And I think if we take that phrase really to heart and 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 recognize the power of its analytic capacity will stop ask it can help us stop asking the wrong questions in that regard let me go see who's who we got next um uh uh vivek go ahead and then we'll go to samantha go ahead i just had uh, a question about the democratic party like failed to alienate or to persuade like in this election cycle like the dnc's like theme was red and blue so it seems that the DNC's target again is just suburban 
white moderate Republicans are centrist. So I guess I'm just wondering like what or if anything is different in this election cycle. <laughs> Everything is different in this election cycle. Like there's there are, there are mistakes made. Uh, this a lot of the same mistakes get made, uh, but this is not 2016. I think like we need to break that. that I, if anything, I think on Monday that would be my this coming Monday my task of to explain why why this is we are not in 2016. Um, yeah, but go I ahead. Did, I did have a full lecture a few weeks ago about relational voting, and there has been a huge investment by the the democratic infrastructure, not necessarily the party, but democratic donors in a different way of approaching voter engagement, in focusing on unlikely voters, in doing peer-to-peer -peer voter engagement in, in, in a way that's very different from the old, let's just focus on likely voters, let's just focus on white suburbs, you know, white suburbs. So there definitely has been a difference, if not by the party, but by the infrastructure, the donors, you know, all of those folks and thinking about unlikely voters this time around. And a lot based on that relational voter model that I shared with you a few weeks ago. But yeah, they are doing a lot of the same things. I mean, like they, this is the, the I mean, it, it, look, ever since that turn came in the spring in which Barack Obama picked up the phone, everybody turned on Bernie Sanders and Biden became the candidate. It was quite clear that the Dems were going to run a very conservative campaign. They were going to be very careful. They were going not going to do anything dramatic or revelatory or even potentially successful. They were just going to plow the same furrow they always do and rely upon Donald Trump to self-destruct. Now, whether that works or not is, a, you know, it, it remains to be seen. Whether they're going to learn the right or the wrong lessons from that also remains to be seen. But I mean, I think it's pretty clear that the coronavirus has played a tremendous role in aiding the Democrats in the boat, not only in that it's made Trump look terrible, because I mean, you saw his chief of staff basically surrender over the weekend to the disease, um, but but it also means that Biden could literally did not have to be in the public eye very often, which is not something he's particularly good at. Uh, so he could he could sort of remain off stage. The Republicans could self destruct, and uh, and the Dems could benefit from a very middle of the road, completely ordinary campaign. Ha were there no coronavirus and Biden the candidate, I I guarantee you he'd getting he'd be getting slaughtered right now. That, that's, I mean, you know, for I mean, whatever predictive capacity that is. Counterfactuals, hey, not a good academic look, but there it is all the same. Um, uh, sir, do you want to offer a closing word or? Um, no, just to say that, I, I, you know, as, as uh, Matt said last week, um, I'm grateful to you as students who are active and organizing right now. It will take you pushing on um, the party, on the left really, not just the party, but the infrastructure, it will take you organizing and pushing. And, and I do just want to say one thing, Professor Cohen talked about how Obama and uh, Sanders modeled their elections as a social movement. And there's, there's definitely advantages to that. There's a double-edged sword to that. The double-edged sword is that a social movement is never about winning an election. It's about winning long-term structural change. And so if people who get excited about a social movement think in the form of an election end their work at the election, all is lost. And so I'll repeat what I've said before, everything I've talked about today and the need to move the Democratic Party to follow the actual will of the people is not just about November 3rd, it's about long after that, really continuing to push the party through the social movement that we need to win everything that we actually need. All right. Awesome. With that, I thank you all. We will see you and Professor Ian Haney Lopez on Wednesday. Thank you all. Yeah, bye.